suddenly, we awake. We find ourselves in a world, a very green world, almost unnaturally so. As we look around, we realize that this place is composed of blocks. We can left-click to place one, and right-click to remove a block. A simple concept, but one that could be quite powerful. Perhaps we will make a nice little house. But as we begin the search for a good place, it becomes quickly apparent that we are not alone in this strange world. Far from it. There are hundreds of beings scattered about, flailing their arms wildly and moving around with no sense of direction. We approach the edge of the world and accidentally step over the ledge. As we fall, we see that those other characters are found here as well. The void below is speckled with tiny dots of the unsettling figures. The world is above us now, moving increasingly out of reach. And the beings fall with us, unseeing, unknowing, their arms flailing forever. This world is one of the very first versions of the game that we now know to be Minecraft. There's no mining nor crafting, and it's truly a bizarre start to what will one day flourish into the most popular game ever developed. But right now, it's May of 2009. It's little more than an experimental project, programmed by a single developer named Notch. In fact, this version is based on a previous game Notch had developed called Ruby Dung. Very few screenshots exist, but at least some of the codebase has been ported to this new project. The RD in the version name alerts us of this. However, a few days later, a user on TIG forum suggests a new name, and Notch adapts it. The title of this game is now Minecraft, Order of the Stone. We know this because Notch has recently started up a Tumblr blog, and has begun to post about his new game. Soon thereafter, he posts a video of the very first known build of Minecraft, called Cave Game Tech Test. Notch clearly realizes that this game has potential, and he begins to make rapid development progress, posting a new video showing blocks and terrain generation. This game is no ruby dung, it's definitely its own thing now, and Notch scraps the RD title, giving it a much more neutral version number. This is the beginning of a twisting and turning tale of Minecraft. Welcome to the Classic Era. Just three days after the first video, Notch outlines some things he wants in Minecraft. This short post includes some familiar modes like creative and survival, but there's also a team-based version of survival, as well as something called fortress mode, where each team builds a fortress independently and the two maps connect to one another. However, this was to happen sometime in the future. For now, Notch gets busy creating a few private test builds, which don't leave his own computer. But the very next day, Notch releases a version of Minecraft for public consumption. For the first time, this game has a logo. However, there's much to be done, including adding blocks such as water. As this video shows, water is not some mundane trickle. No, water is a terrifying force, filling all available space with so much as the slightest opening. This unstopping mass of soulless blue liquid is unnerving in a very strange and visceral way. As features are added, Notch briefly considers adding blood to the game, but decides against it. He also outlines a list of blocks he hopes to add in the future. Some are quite familiar and will be added shortly, such as sand, glass, and trees. Others will not find themselves in the game for over 10 years, such as Notch's idea of large crystals hidden deep underground. Still further, some blocks will never make it to the game, such as spikes or pulleys. On May 25th, Notch makes an experimental aesthetic change to Minecraft and offsets the polygons at random angles. The results are… well, take a look for yourself. This adjustment causes the world to feel much more chaotic and insecure. Although the gameplay remains the same, it's visually disconcerting. As a result, this change proves to be controversial amongst the few people playing Minecraft. Despite Notch calling this direction awesome, he makes what will prove to be a very important decision and scraps the aesthetic in favor of 90 degree angles. A crisis has been averted. Progress continues with steady additions to the game, but Notch is now ready to begin work on the next major phase of Minecraft multiplayer. What follows is a series of multiplayer test builds. Notch quickly finds success, as we see in the very first known video of a Minecraft multiplayer session. There are multiple people on this server, and another video shows that the same world is being played from two perspectives. We also discover that the electronic music producer C418 is a Minecraft fan, as evidenced by a post on his website. It's not long before he creates a mock-up video showing what Minecraft could potentially sound like.
About 50 seconds into the video, we hear something amazing. Yep, this is it. Calm1.ogg. Unfortunately, it would be some time before it would be heard in-game, but the first appearance is nonetheless an iconic moment in gaming history. Much of the month of June is spent making technical changes to the multiplayer code, but there are nonetheless some notable additions, such as flowers and sponges. This time is also home to one of the earliest known mentions of Spleef, a competitive multiplayer minigame. Minecraft has now sold 990 copies, only a month after pre-orders were opened. At 9.95 euros each, this is Notch's first exposure to some actual cash from the game. As the multiplayer game mode matures, Notch starts to think about one of his original goals, a survival mode for Minecraft. He outlines several things which he wants to see. This includes combat against hostile mobs, such as goblins, trolls, or wolves. There will be crafting, which will allow a player to create better equipment to help them survive. And there will be some type of in-game, perhaps a big evil mob. With multiplayer finishing up, Notch will make a fork in the development pathway and spend an entire month working on a survival test. During this development month, Notch announces Minecraft's first DLC, the Dungeons and Levers expansion pack. There are some interesting ideas here, including dungeon mode, where mining and crafting are disabled, as well as programmable tiles such as pressure plates, levers, and doors. However, Notch admits that this pack will not be released until the distant future. During this month, Notch shows off several videos and images of his progress, since he isn't releasing any public versions. This helps keep the community engaged as he works. And then, on September 1st, the first survival test is finally released to the public. The game has changed. Now, blocks can be mined and put into an inventory. Breaking a tree drops planks. Furthermore, the player now has hearts of health. Take too much damage, that world is gone, forever. The only option is to generate a new one. Once again, we find that we are no longer alone in the Minecraft world. There are pigs, which drop a brown mushroom that can restore some health. But these pigs are the least of our concerns. First, there are zombies and skeletons, both of which move and attack very quickly. Some of them wear armor, and skeletons can fire arrows from afar. But neither of these is quite as bothersome as the third hostile mob. We see it in the distance, a darkened figure in an unnatural shape. It notices us and moves in our direction by hopping. Its face is distorted with dark holes for eyes and an expression of eternal suffering. We fire our arrows, yet its pursuit is relentless, culminating in a vicious melee attack. Somehow, we manage to defeat the beast, but it leaves us one parting gift. A huge explosion permanently damaging the beautiful landscape. Surely this… this thing is not right not natural. How could Notch allow such an unholy abomination into a game like Minecraft? This terrible story is our introduction to many of the staples of Minecraft survival. In some ways, this version of the Creeper is more terrifying than what it would eventually become. But it's memorable, and it's unique. For the first time, Minecraft has a character which sets it apart from other games, and the Creeper will eventually become one of the most recognizable icons of all time. Development on the survival test continues, and Notch adds many more features including spiders. By late October, Notch has decided that it's time to flesh out creative mode. With that, we enter into a period known as Late Classic. On October 30th, Notch reveals some interesting information regarding the history of the game. In a Tumblr post, he confirms that RubyDung was indeed the original source code. He also acknowledges Infiniminer as a direct inspiration. But there's another interesting nugget here. The human model is from a previous game called Zombie Town, which Notch had spent some time coding. Even better, there's a video of it. It's a bit of a strange origin story. How could such a recognizable character come from such a dark and gritty video? Notch has been getting some ideas in Minecraft, and he soon announces that Minecraft supports MD3 models, a file format used by the id Tech 3 engine. To show off its purported advantages, Notch posts an example image from the Minecraft engine, and it's not comfortable to look at. What is even going on? Okay, but it's just a proof of concept. Notch did this to show that the engine can support 10,000 of these. But then, a week later, Notch posts a video to YouTube simply called Minecraft MD3 Test, and it's not for the faint of heart.
This video is terrifying. Unnatural beings are found in the Minecraft world, following the player. Their motions are jagged, their bent shapes are unsettling. It's just wrong. It's as deep in the uncanny valley as you can go. This is perhaps the darkest moment in Minecraft's development. On a lighter note, Notch posts on Tumblr asking for an artist to help out with the graphics. 27 people respond, and Notch ultimately chooses Hayden Scott Barron, also known as Doc. His credits include the Roller Coaster Tycoon series, and he immediately makes an impact on the game's art direction, creating a totally new logo. Doc also begins work on new MD3 character models to add to the game. Hopefully these will be less disturbing. We now reach another turning point in the history of Minecraft. The game is now officially in development, or, for short, in dev. Doc's addition to the team becomes clear quite quickly. On December 31st, a version is released that allows the player to view their inventory by pressing I. The character has been replaced with a girl wearing a frog hat. This is Rana, and she will soon spawn naturally throughout the world. It's very interesting to see these frog girls walking around, and they feel somewhat out of place, although nowhere nearly as bad as the first MD3 tests. Doc has created several pieces of concept art which allow us to see how he views Rana, and this proves to be an interesting look into the direction which he sees Minecraft going. The inventory screen also includes some other new components, including statistics like attack, defense, and speed. These attributes do not currently affect gameplay, and they will soon be removed. The inventory also has several types of armor, including hats, chest plates, pants, and boots in four different materials. There's also a quiver of arrows, as well as some tools. As time goes on, these tools will eventually gain uses, but for now, this inventory is full of unimplemented features. The attributes, quiver, and studded armor will eventually be removed entirely. On January 6th, Notch adds the capability to take an isometric screenshot by holding F7. Unfortunately, it's a bit glitched and doesn't quite work as intended. That doesn't seem to bother the player base, however, as by January 13th, there are over 100,000 registered users on Minecraft.net. To ease new players into the game, Notch changes world generation to include a simple house on startup. It's made of mossy cobblestone and contains several of a new block type called a chest, which allow players to store items outside of their inventory. These chests contain nearly every block and item in the game. One chest alerts us to a recently updated feature, tools, including a shovel, a pickaxe, and an axe. These allow for more efficient mining of dirt, stone, and wood, respectively. It also includes flint and steel, which allow players to set fire to the surrounding world. A few days later, another update rolls around. This version includes a special block called a gear. Although it's not easily accessible, and can be attached to surfaces, perhaps an indication of future designs. There are also more things to find in the world. A new ore has been added. It appears to be a bluish crystal of some type, and it's called an emerald. Although nobody knows it right now, this is another iconic moment in Minecraft history, as this mysterious material will eventually be renamed to diamonds. An update is released the next day, and suddenly these emeralds have a use. There's a brand new feature called crafting. Simply hit B on the keyboard to bring up a 3x3 interface. But the house has changed. We can no longer take whatever resources we want. Instead, we must walk up to a tree and punch it, causing it to drop several planks. We can then use these to create sticks, which, in turn, can be used to craft a wooden pickaxe. There are more options than just that. We can make swords, shovels, and axes as well. But what about iron? We can mine the block, but we cannot craft anything out of ore. It needs to be smelted, which can be done easily by throwing the block into a fire, producing an iron ingot. This allows us to create even better tools. If we explore a bit, we find that the work of Doc is coming to fruition. Rana no longer spawns naturally, but there are several new characters wandering throughout the world. They include two versions of a guy named Steve, and another person named Beast Boy. This brings our total number of NPCs created by Doc to four. Although it's nice that the world is less empty, these characters give the world a slightly disjunct feeling. They don't quite fit the blocky aesthetic, like they're from another universe. It seems as though Notch is having second thoughts about Doc. The two Steves and Beast Boy are removed from the game, lasting just two days and one day respectively. And on February 5th, Notch announces on Tumblr that Doc will no longer be involved with Minecraft. Notch says that he prefers the freedom to move forward on his own without needing to wait for others. It is, after all, how he's approached development this whole time. The same day, Notch posts a video of a new mob called a giant, which is a huge zombie that roams the world. Giants will remain in the game's code for the next 10 years, but they will never spawn naturally. 
A few days ago, Notch added a title screen to Minecraft. It includes several menu options and some flashing text. It may not look like much, but this is a signature component of Minecraft. Throughout the in-dev phase, Notch has been working on level generation. Upon starting a new level, the player has several options for what the world is going to be. They can choose the size to be small, normal, or huge. The shape can be adjusted as well. Square is a square, and long turns it into a rectangle. Deep, however, reduces the surface area in favor of a much deeper y-axis, allowing 256 blocks of range as opposed to the typical 64. Another interesting generation option is the map type. Island generates an island with the surrounding ocean. Inland fills out the land to the borders. Flat creates a totally flat world with no hills or ridges. The most interesting of the group is floating, which causes the world to generate islands which are suspended in the air. It's a dangerous map type to be sure, but it's also very pleasing to see the land out in the distance. It adds just a touch of fantastical flair to the world. The final generation option is, in many ways, the most intriguing. It's called the map theme. Normal is what we've been exploring this whole time, but there's also a version called Hell. Gone are the grassy hills, they've been replaced by bare dirt. There is no water in this world, only lava, and the skies become a darkened reddish hue. The calming world of Minecraft has been changed into a totally different feel. There are more theme options, including Paradise, which contains large beaches and eternal daylight, and Woods, which is an overcast world of dense trees. These generation options can be combined. For example, a large floating deep hell map generates a vertical stack of dirt islands with a lava lake down below. Or we could do a small paradise long island for a relaxing day on our own private area. There are many possibilities, all of which can change how we might choose to play the game. Notch continues development, adding features such as furnaces and armor. But on February 21st, he has a potentially game-breaking idea. What if the world was infinite? Why limit the map to a single size when the world can be generated as far as the eye can see? It only takes him a few days to make his decision. There will be a new fork of development called InfDev. It's back to square one. Infinite worlds require rebuilding the game almost from the ground up. On February 27th, Notch releases the first public version of InfDev. We spawn into a very different Minecraft world. Gone are the multitude of block types. There are no mobs, and even thrown items don't render. But this new place has a huge advantage. It doesn't matter how far we walk, more land keeps generating. The potential is clear. This is the way forward for Minecraft. It will allow the player to be truly free to construct as much as they want without fear of limited space or resources. But there are also some strange features to this world. At the origin, there are obsidian axes, which extend in the cardinal directions forever. We can walk along these and see the new land production, but such an artificial structure still doesn't feel quite natural. It breaks the immersion of this new place. The world, however, is hiding a deeper secret. There's something out there that you will probably never find unless you know the directions. We spawn in the world and follow the obsidian axis north. After about 500 blocks, we make a left turn, leaving the comfort of directionality behind. As we continue to walk, we see something out in the distance. What could it be? Some type of mountain? And as we get closer, we suddenly realize, this is no mountain, but a pyramid. It's absolutely huge, almost unthinkably so. It's made entirely from bricks. The base is 63 blocks on each side, and it extends to the build limit. This pyramid is unlike anything we've seen in Minecraft so far. It's not just the random landscape. This was constructed by someone. Although the pyramid was designed by Notch to test world generation features, it opens the door to an incredibly powerful idea which will shape the future of Minecraft. Perhaps the player is not the first sentient being to explore this place. Someone has been here before. The world has a history. And for the first time, we see this potential. Maybe the Minecraft world is not simply a sandbox. The early versions of InfDev introduce another strange quirk. At some point, the world generation code breaks down. At 32 million blocks from spawn, we reach a huge stone wall. This is the very first version of the Farlands, although they cannot be reached manually as block collision has broken down long before this point. Still, this is undeniably an important point in Minecraft's history what truly exists at the edge of a seemingly infinite world. 
Although the axes and pyramids are eventually removed, Notch begins to tweak the generation setting. More oddities present themselves, such as giant monoliths which spawn in the middle of nowhere. Notch is slowly adding the missing features from InDev, and soon, new features make an appearance. Cave systems become more complex. Clouds become three-dimensional. Notch adds signs and doors. During this time, Notch decides that he's going to leave his day job and focus on Minecraft full-time. But soon thereafter, he finds himself burnt out and decides to take about a month off from development. The break serves him well, and he begins adding features once more. And on June 18th, he begins the tradition of the Secret Friday update. The first one includes rails and minecarts. These act like chests and can be filled with items. June 25th brings Secret Friday update number two. The structure generation code is finally put to use with the addition of dungeons, which are rare underground rooms. They contain a block that spawns monsters, as well as chests holding various equipment. And for the first time, the concept of loot has been added. There are items that can only be found in these chests, such as saddles. Once again, we find ourselves asking, who left this here? Why do these places even exist? At this point, Notch decides somewhat arbitrarily to redo the version numbering system, and the game enters its alpha stage. Secret Friday number 3 adds redstone. Now there's a way to build devices and circuitry. Another Secret Friday update adds the jukebox, allowing the players to find discs hidden in the world. The Halloween update is another pivotal moment, with the addition of a second dimension, the Nether. Then, Minecraft enters beta, and the feature set becomes even richer. On November 18th, 2011, version 1.0 is finally released, which includes potions, magic, and a new dimension called the End. Conveniently, that's where our story is going to end for today. The alpha and beta versions, while large in the number of additions, are much more refined than earlier versions of Minecraft. There aren't as many forgotten features, so that's why I'm not covering them in detail here. But the very early days of development were a wild ride, especially compared to modern Minecraft. I hope you learned something new in this video. I think it's fulfilling for me to spend serious time playing the older versions. I had an extremely hard time figuring out how to do it since the main Minecraft launcher is missing a large chunk, especially from InfDev. But I stumbled across a launcher called Betacraft, and that's what I used to record the footage. This video isn't sponsored by them or anything, I just wanted to let you know about it. As always, let me know what you think. I love reading your comments, and you can hop on over to the Retro Gaming Now Discord if you want to talk with the community. Old versions of Minecraft are fascinating to me, and I'm going to spend even more time playing them. We'll go ahead and end with that. This has been Retro Gaming Now. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye.